Okay, let me first introduce Dieter. It is really a great pleasure to have Dieter here. I'm sure everyone here knows Dieter, and I will do the introduction anyway. Dieter is currently a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington. He's also leading the robotics research lab at NVIDIA. He has made tremendous contributions to a range of research fields, ranging from robotics, artificial intelligence, and computer vision. He is the author of the phenomenal book, Probabilistic Robotics. Uh -huh. He is also a fellow of ECM, IEEE, AAAI, and recipient of numerous awards, including the IEEE RAS Pioneer Awards and Best, Best Paper Awards in CVPR, AAAI, ECRA, IROS, and the list just goes on. There are just so many things we can introduce about Dieter, but I do not want to use any more of Dieter's time. Hmm. Please welcome Dieter to share his thoughts on the use of implicit representations in robotic manipulation. Hi. Hey, buddy. Thanks so much for inviting me over. And um, the funny thing is I will not talk actually about implicit representations per se, but I think uh, I'll talk about some work that of course touches upon that and make some uh, some connections here. Is it okay without mask? It, yeah. I think it's much easier to understand for everybody too. So um, yeah, just to put, oh, wait, let me start. It. No. Okay, just to put uh, kind of this a bit into context, let me get rid of these. Okay, now I can see. So, um, this slide is, I, I uh, call it non-explicit representations, because when you say implicit representations, it seems to um, encompass a very specific kind of representation, right? But of course, there's many other kind of representations that we're using for manipulation tasks that are, um, uh, yeah, not specifically explicit. By explicit, I would mean that we have um, explicit 3D shape models, for example, of the objects, and that also that we typically focus on estimating the 60 pose of an object and then do planning and manipulation with these kind of models. So I would see kind of anything that is not kind of focusing on this aspect, I just you call it non-explicit, which includes these so-called implicit models. Um, and what I don't list here is, for example, also of course work on that we've done on just pure point cloud reasoning, right? Where you just go to directly from point clouds to, for example, manipulating picking up objects. So here I wanna focus a bit more on, let's say the kinds of representations. Um, a lot of, I think, inspiration we're getting is really from these, what people are called these foundation models that have been uh, very, very successful in computer vision and in especially natural language processing which are these models that are just pre-trained on huge amounts of data on, for example, from the web, it could, it could be text data, it could be image data. And uh, the idea of these very large scale models, first of all, they, they to take weeks to train, um, is that by being trained on such a diverse set of data that they generate um, representations that are extremely robust that you can then use um, just as kind of um, a representation for many downstream tasks, right? Where you can then, for example, in image type settings, you can do whatever, you can extract masks from them, you can do object recognition, detection, all these different kinds of tasks. Um, the, the key architecture that I think uh, emerges has been the transformer architecture. And I'll two examples of where we're using these in our work. Um, and from my perspective, uh, as a roboticist, I must admit I'm continuously blown away by how good these models are and how capable they are, both, for example, we you know GPT-3, like text generation, image generation, um, um, image understanding, all these different tasks, and especially also um, that they are trained on extremely weak supervision. Uh, so as roboticists, I typically tend to say, oh, we need to explicitly supervise our models by a very specific task we want them to solve to make sure they have the right kind of 3D representations. But these kind of models are often trained just on, for example, um, masking tasks, right? Like for example, I'm sure many of you know, like masked order encoders, MAE, which is just like an input is an image and you mask out huge sections of the image and then um, the transformer has to kind of generate uh, an embedding from which you can reconstruct the complete image. Uh, so this is, there's no explicit kind of semantics to this task or anything like that. Um, the capability of the network just comes from the fact that they are trained on these huge amounts of data. Um, and recently we've seen some 
work in robotics, like the mass visual pre-training and the R3M work that kind of starts to apply the same ideas to robotics tasks where um, they're using more or less exactly the same techniques. The only difference is that they train them on data that looks a bit closer to robotic settings, which means, for example, egocentric human manipulation videos and things like that. And also that, um, the, for example, the, uh, the R3M is also trained on, on video data, um, contrastive learning um, with time contrastive loss. Um, and my sense is that actually, uh, as I will show in some experiments that these models are not, it's, it's not quite as easy as some people kind of think it might be. Um, and I guess we as robots often have a hunch that these models still don't capture quite, I think the 3D structure and the kind of compositional nature of, see, of, of um, scenes that we have to deal with in ro robotics, especially robot manipulation, where you have multiple objects in the scene, the relative positions of these objects matters, um, and how you represent them. So um, uh, we have some experiments uh, showing also that I think these models are not quite ready yet for, uh, for kind of to be called quite universal or something like that. So there's some more work to be done there. And then of course, what we'll hear many talks today about are the NERF models, which are kind of the other kind of recent idea that is just kind of mind blowing what, what's possible with these models, right? These are typically MLPs pre-trained um, with kind of a different kind of loss. In this case, it's mostly geared towards typically reconstruction or also similarity uh, kind of losses. And um, they've been applied very successfully in robotic manipulation tasks specifically, also fine-grained manipulation tasks, learning from demonstrations, reinforcement learning. And uh, several of the key authors in this area are here. Uh, and I heard our CVPR had more than 50 NERF papers this year. so. Uh, it doesn't even make sense to try to list them anymore, it feels like it, but I think Frank Dellert has, uh, has an attempt on his website to summarize all of them, uh, of the recent work. So this is another area that's really exploding, I think, and it's super exciting. Um, I want to talk about two lines of work that we've done recently, which is these SOR nets, um, where the idea there is we want to learn kind of embeddings, representations for objects, but um, uh, two pieces compared to the standard foundation models, rather than learning, for example, embedding for a whole image, we would like to learn specific embeddings for objects so that we get some notion of compositionality of the scene. And also we wanted to see, can you train them with um, a somewhat relatively weak supervision? And in our case, we use kind of predicates that a task and motion planning system might use uh, for manipulation. Um, and then also uh, some work you might have heard transporter nets and Andy uh, introduced these and then some work we did is clipboard where uh, the representation is more um, specifically geared towards um, uh, not representing specifically objects in the scene but focusing much more on recognizing for example where I should move the gripper in the scene in order to uh, achieve a certain task so we call these more action centric representations rather than object centric representations. Okay, so I'll give an um, overview of, of, of these two lines of work, the SORNETS clipboard, and then also some updates, some more results we've done, uh, in experiments we've done with the SORNETS, and, uh, and then also a follow-up work to clipboard, which we call Perceiver Actor. All right, and now I'll, I'll see how fast I can get through all of this. So here again, so Perceiver Actor. The Perceiver Actor work is under review, so... Um, you're, you're the first ones to, to see this. Um, so SORNET, again, the idea was um, having a flexible representation that has some notion of compositionality of these scenes. And uh, the architecture is as follows. Or here where the input is, let's say, an RGB image of the scene. And then we um, also provide to the network because we don't know we don't want to be fixed on the kinds of numbers of objects and things like that. So we can actually condition the, the, the network by saying, hey, these are the four objects that I might care about in this scene. So these have to, don't have to be uh, crops from that image. It's just kind of canonical views on the objects that then help the network identify which objects you care about. These are then fed into an embedding network. I'll give a little bit more detail what that looks like. And out hopefully come embeddings for the objects that you query by providing them with these canonical patches. Okay, and then um, 
we train them or use these um, using so-called readout networks, which we can just MLPs that take as input the embedding vector and the output is, for example, in this case, could be a logical state. Uh, for example, in the scene is the, the blue object stacked on the red object or something like that. Okay, and the key is that these embeddings are trained um, through these readout networks, but later on, you hopefully can use them even for different kinds of tasks, okay? And as you see, this is very much also still on, ongoing work, so we haven't perfectly solved any of these problems. Um, so the input is, uh, we're using a transformer architecture. So the, we take the image, we um, generate these um, patches from the image that we then feed as um, tokens into a transformer. In addition to these patches, we also feed these canonical object views into the transformer. Um, they're flattened out pixel, pixel level wise. Um, and then we also add a um, positional encoding so that um, network can reason about kind of maybe where these patches are, for example, in the image. And also positional encodings, we don't have position encodings for the canonical object views on the right because we want to um, uh, be independent of the order in which these objects are presented. And that is fed into a transformer architecture, uh, pretty standard, and outcome hopefully embeddings for the four um, object views, for the canonical objects in that scene. Okay, so the context patches are just kind of telling the network, okay, these are the things for which I want to have an embedding. And in this case, again, it is canonical views, but you could imagine that we can do the same thing if you have a recurrent structure, that these canonical views might come from, for example, from a previous time frame. Or you could imagine if you have instance segmentation, um, then you could also feed in these instance masks as canonical views. We haven't done that, but conceptually, the architecture. Um, can, can definitely handle that. I'm pretty confident about that, okay? The nice thing about this architecture is also that, again, it can handle different numbers of objects. So for example, if you feed in this one, then it's gonna give you the embeddings only for the blue, green, and red object. Uh, the order of these objects doesn't matter, right? It's just kind of, you have your queries and for each query image, you get um, the corresponding embeddings. Uh, we train them, and, and then we wanted actually to train them not on um, very explicit losses, which means we didn't want to provide the network with, for example, object masks or specific object poses during training. We wanted to see if we can train it similar to these previous foundation models on a, on a pretty weak loss. And in this case, the loss uh, we chose were just some predicates that describe properties about the objects in the scene. So for example, and, and these come out of a task and motion planning system. So for example, um, there's an image and, the, and, and uh, what the relations could be, for example, is the blue block held by the robot? That's a predicate that's just true or false, right? Or is the red block in the far region of the table? We split the table into three regions. Um, and you could also ask about whether objects are aligned or whether an object is in the gripper and things like that. So it's actually very simple um, binary predicates that we're checking out. Okay, so no explicit supervision on these uh, more, let's say, spatial geometric uh, properties. And how this works now is, again, we have the network down here, and then up here we have just these readout networks where, for example, this is has object robot X, and this readout networks, the network gets as input an embedding, and then it should output whether the blue object in this case um, is in the robot's proper or not. Okay, and that is applied then to all the embeddings and it should produce the, uh, the corresponding predicate value. Right, in this case, for example, this one could true, false, and, and this we can provide pretty easily, especially in simulation, of course. You can also ask about, we have uh, some reader networks that take uh, two embeddings as input and the output should be, for example, if these two objects are stacked in the scene or not. Okay, so that's the only supervision we provide during training. The training data looks like this. Um, and uh, the idea is also that from training to testing, we might change the numbers of objects that we query. Uh, we also change the colors and things like that. So uh, uh, at testing, for example, there are objects that the system hasn't seen. 
And in the interest of time, I'm actually not gonna go into it because I have some more exciting newer actually results, but the idea is that it actually achieves very high accuracy on these predicate um, classification results, which means um, that the network actually was able to identify, for example, just from these image contexts to um, obviously find out where the object is in the image and the spatial relationship between them at the predicate level. Uh, one interesting task we can do then with this is uh, we can also see if there's some more spatial information in, in these embeddings. Um, so where the idea is they're pre-trained here on the left side only using these predicates. And then what we do is we fix the embeddings and train a new readout network that should give us more spatial information like what is the XYZ position, relative position between pairs of objects or what is the relative position between the robot gripper and objects, okay? And it turns out that actually these embeddings provide not super precise information about that, but something that clearly hints at uh, that the network learned pretty good spatial information despite really being only trained on these predicates, okay? So what this shows is kind of where we can query then the network, for example, in this case, what is the relative position between the gripper and these different objects? And, the, and then the, the pointer is kind of the, network output from that, okay? And again, the embeddings were solidly trained on these predicate tasks, but they need to capture still spatial information. And um, I think this hints that, that we can actually train these systems um, on, on, on various different tasks that don't have to be uh, very explicit. Okay, now I wanna quickly give you some more results that we've done recently. And I, I mentioned that there's been some recent work on where people use these so-called foundation models and applied them to robotics. Uh, for example, there's again, this MVP work, mass visual pre-training for motor control, a universal representation for robot manipulation, this R3M work. And we wanted to see how they work on our data. Um, and we compared it also, we saw what would happen if you would feed a clip model in there. Uh, we also tested how just a standard mass order encoder works in this setting. Um, and we used two versions of mass order encoders. One is the MAE that is just trained on ImageNet, which is the standard kind of MAE that people use in for downstream tasks. But we also, uh, because our data is more simulation data and looks different, we also wanted to see um, what happens if you train a mass order encoder on our simulation data itself with the mass order encoder loss function, which means um, it's just these kind of image completion tasks. And if you train it on that, um, do these embeddings that they generate, um, how, how well do they work on the tasks like predicate classification or regression in our scenes? Because there's, a, I think we have a bit more focus on the real 3D understanding of the scene. Uh, we have two data sets. The first one is this one here. Again, simulation, uh, just the block stacking kind of stuff. Another one that's getting a bit more complicated. Uh, we call it the kitchen data. It's not a kitchen or anything like that. But uh, you see that uh, more variety of objects, different shapes, bowls, plates, and things like that. And it's more challenging. Uh, and, and again, we have for all of these, we have... Um, pretty small set of, of predicates that we provide for all of these scenes, and then we can see how these networks work. So the first one on the upper left issue that's interesting is if we take any of these pre-trained networks, right, like CLIP, R3, M, MVP, MAE, then and freeze them, feed in the image, and train them on the predicate classification tasks. Right, so we take the embedding as it is and then train new MLPs and see if these embeddings contain enough information to uh, learn these embedding tasks. You can see uh, this the F1 score that they are not doing very well. So on the right side, you can see what we get with our SOR nets. Um, uh, I, I can give more details on the specifics, but you can see that they are actually obviously don't capture uh, the information very well for these tasks. Now you might say that this is also because they're trained on real data and we just have the simulation data. But at the same time, I think you could argue a human would have no trouble identifying things even in these kind of images. And uh, another key point here is actually, if you take uh, the mass order encoders and train them on our data, which means on the simulation data, 
millions of images with the mass order encoder loss, then on the predicate task, you can see that it's doing better than the other uh, representations, but it's still far less capable than SOR nets. So for me, this is kind of a hint that the kind of losses that were very successful for image kind of classification tasks don't really work um, well uh, for the more specific robotics manipulation settings that we have. And I think that's an indication also that we need to really look at other kinds of losses, other kinds of supervisions that we're using to train these networks. Okay, and uh, again, I can provide some more details here, but we see the same trend also for if we train them to do regression, for example. Okay, then um, another thing we can do is, of course, uh, we just retrain the networks uh, and even retrain the embeddings for them on these tasks, and then we're getting results where they are getting closer to um, the capabilities of the SOR nets, but that, of course, beats the purpose because you're retraining the whole embedding uh, on, on that specific data set and on these specific tasks. So, um, uh, again, I think the, the key takeaway from my perspective is that the so-called pre-trained and universal techniques that you see here do not work very well yet on manipulation tasks. More work to be done. Um, now I want to talk about uh, briefly on the work that we've done on this more action-centric representation, where the idea is um, the input is, is not the focus is not on the objects per se, but the focus is much more on recognizing what action should the manipulator perform on the scene, and those actions don't have to be, for example, dependent on specific objects or so. Um, how many people or ha have people seen cl the clipboard work that we've done? I'll, I'll just very quickly go through this because I want to actually talk about and have 10 minutes left, right? So I want to briefly talk about actually the more recent stuff, the extent. So clipboard, the idea is, it was inspired very much by two lines of work, Andy's um, and transporter networks, where the idea is um, you have kind of a pick and place task. It's a top view, top down view onto the scene. And uh, you can specify pick and place kind of tasks just by indicating where the gripper in the top down view should go, which is an XY position. And if you have a gripper versus suction cup, which orientation it should take. And the placement would then also be where the gripper should go and release the object, for example, and which orientation it should take on. So it's kind of a, a 2D XY with one orientation tasks. And they've shown that it works extremely well. Um, they had to train uh, transporter networks for every task from scratch and knew because um, there was no way to condition the task well using, for example, language. So we want to see, can we condition the task on language and combine it then with these clip representations, which were trained to learn a consistent embedding between images and text and image captions in this case. Uh, you can ask me later if you do want to have more details on that. Uh, the architecture wasn't really kind of just using transporter networks and combining them with these clip representations. And out came actually a system, I think, that I thought was pretty impressive where we can learn, for example, the robot to perform a wide variety of tasks from a very small number of demonstrations. So in his case, here are some examples. All of this was trained on 180 demonstrations. Put the red blocks in the green bowl. Um, the one key aspect here was that because we were conditioning on language, we were actually able to train a single network. We were able to train a single network on all these tasks because the language kind of helps you to disentangle the different tasks. Another aspect was that um, the single task network actually performs slightly better than individual networks. And um, we saw some transfer based on the semantics between them. So for example, if on one task, the system learns to know what a green or a red block is, and on a different task, it knows what a, it learns what a yellow block is, then it can actually transfer that information across tasks. At the same time, big caveat, uh, we do not see like the full compositionality transfer uh, on language. That is something that is totally open for future work. But I thought it's, 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 it's pretty impressive the kind of different, how many different kinds of tasks it can do and how robust it works like in the real world with a very few number of demonstrations. So now, ah, yeah, 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 no. 
end results. This was just if you just use the transporter network. Uh, this is if you just would use the clip network embeddings. Uh, and this is clipboard, and this is clipboard trained on all the tasks together. So we get an additional benefit from multitask training. Uh, but now the interesting part: how do we go from to 3D? Because this was only top down kind of X, Y, and orientation, but typically, of course, you want to do full 6D uh, manipulation, which means uh, 3D position and 3D orientation. And uh, that is some recent work that Mohit did. It's we call it perceiver actor. Um, uh, the representation idea is based on some work that James, um, Stephen James uh, introduced. It's just a CVPR paper, a C2FR, cost to fine, attention role for robot manipulation, I think. Uh, they have a two, typically two layer architecture where the idea is you represent the space by 3D voxels, okay? And then for every voxel, you would discretize the orientation of the gripper also in 3D. And then they learn uh, a 3D unit architecture to do in their case, actually for reinforcement enforcement learning. And they got state of the art results on RL benchmarks um, and the, um, we are using a similar idea here, but uh, use it in the transformer architecture. And that's one of these examples where I also feel like sometimes it's just crazy how this stuff works. But the idea is very simple. So you imagine you have a workspace of one cubic meter, you voxelize it into one centimeter cubes. So it's 100 by 100 by 100. Um, then uh, we take these and uh, do a 3D convolution to um, downscale it to five by five centimeter tokens that we can feed into a transformer. Okay, so we have then 20 by 20 by 20, 8,000 tokens that are just light, light up. Um, we additionally feed into the transporter, if you look here into the, the network architecture, also an encoding of the language task of the language um, command that came with the demonstration. And then the output of this transformer is then which of the one by one by one voxels represents the gripper pose that the robot should achieve in order to do the next step of a task. And also uh, a discretized version of the 3D orientation where we're doing the 3D, uh, the different orientations um, independently. So it's three times 72 um, output classifier output. Okay. So it's actually pretty big network. And to do the attention, we are borrowing the idea of the perceiver networks uh, where we are actually also learning 2,000 latent vectors that are just trained from the data. And we do the cross attention between them. We can talk about details maybe later in the break if, if you want some more. But it's, it's a reasonably standard transformer architecture. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's pretty big. We do positional encoding and all of that and um, train it kind of exactly the same way we do on transporter. But now the whole thing is 3D or 6D, depending on how you want to view this. Here's the representation. Let me just give you one example here. So let's assume put one line in the bottom bin, then the network is trained. So we extract from the demonstrations, we extract kind of key points for where the gripper should go. Okay. So, oh, wait, let me, sorry. This is what the voxel representation looks like. The output of the network, the red dot, this is the voxel that the network outputs as that is where the gripper should go next. And it goes, of course, along with uh, this represents kind of the 3D gripper pose. Okay, this is output by the network. And then the robot just moves to that pose. We feed that and then the network generates a new gripper pose. And the robot moves. And you can see that it's a full 3D orientation as well, right? In order to do these kind of tasks. Okay, so the key representations are these voxels and output is then the full 60 is another example. And also this is kind of doing sequ uh, sequential tasks with multiple key poses because um, and the network still gets only the single command down here. So it has to actually learn kind of what would be the next step in that demonstration or in that task. Uh, let me just give you some examples here and then we're done. Uh, and this was also just from a very small number of demonstrations, but we're getting kind of the same idea set we had for clipboard 
Um, and now we're getting this in the full 3D, 6D space. Um, the language, we do not use clip in this context. The language is really just kind of fed into the, um, into the transformer network, okay? shouldn't have showed you the failure. But you can see it can distinguish like top draw, middle draw, draw, bottom draw. It's independent when you move that thing around, it works. So it's actually surprisingly robust. And that's of course a good bunch of uh, simulation results. And again, all of this is just with a single network. Now one caveat, the, the also with the uh, clipboard, even though it's only, let's say, 100 demonstrations, the training itself takes, might take actually a week. Okay, because the network is trained on all these um, spatial randomizations um, in order to generalize well. Um, and there's been work here by Rob Platt's team here where they did um, 3D uh, equivalent representations and showed that it can, be, can speed up, for example, in the 2D case at least, uh, the transporter net training. So I think similar ideas could be applied here too to speed this up. Right, just one quick result and then I'm done. Um, this is the result we're getting on, on a good number of, of tasks in the benchmark. Of, let's say a success rate of 43. This is, there was a recent work uh, here on, on BC0 um, uh, at call last year. If you just use the standard RGB, the image Im embeddings, you can see that the success rate is very, very low. This is the work by Stephen James that he just, that inspired ours where they use a 3D unit architecture. Um, and you can see that we're getting a very, very significant boost by our the more capable architecture that uh, the, is based more on the transformer representations rather than the 3DU network. Uh, this is what you would get without language. So our perceived actor actually without language is better than these works um, if they use language. And with that, uh, we're coming to the conclu conclusions. Um, I think we clearly do not yet have anything like foundational models for robotics, right? Um, I, we, we see some success stories in vision and language, but I think for robotics manipulation, um, we're still pretty far away from that. Uh, at the same time, I think we should strive for generating these so that um, people can actually download pre-trained networks and don't have to redo everything from scratch again. I think uh, for manipulation, we need somewhat more structured representations rather than just single image embeddings. But of course, that could easily be totally wrong, as we know. So if people may be training on enough data, uh, you don't need any structure and it just comes out of the data. Um, I think transformers are just uh, an extremely capable architecture, right? That we see over and over again, that they are just able to digest uh, huge amounts of data and learn very complex representations. Uh, NERF models, equally uh, also mind-blowingly uh, capable. Um, I think so far they are a bit more geared towards almost explicit representations compared to the stuff that I've, I've shown. But uh, that's, that's also, I think, a really, really exciting directions. Some questions I would have, yeah, if we want to learn these foundational models for robotics, what kind of data should we train on, right? Is it just enough to use YouTube videos or egocentric human videos? Do we need robotics data? Uh, can we do it just in simulation up to some level? Um, also, how much data do we actually need? And I think what's really interesting, what kind of supervision should be used for this data, right? Like, should we just do mass order encoder kind of things, just contrastive learning, or do we need maybe more specific supervision? Like for example, the NERF models, right? They have a specific, a, a, a clear kind of metric, geometric inspired uh, supervision loss, right? And um, I think uh, these are all open questions, right? We, we, we don't really know what's, going to be the, the best way for moving forward on that. So for example, with this perceiver actor that I just showed you, we've only trained it now on this very small set of tasks, uh, focusing kind of like what Clipboard also did, trained from a small number of examples. But the question would be, we, there's no reason why we could not feed in a million 
examples or a million tasks, right? Because we are now in this transformer architecture world and I'd be really interested in seeing what, what's gonna happen then. And maybe then these 3D representations have features that are very, very capable and useful for many different tasks. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you for the great talk and amazing demos. Do we have any questions? Maybe we have time for just one question. Ross. I can take a few questions, right? But uh, so some of the things that was great about this, um, the, the some of the last stuff you showed uh, had hints of captain motion planning level uh when they're coming out. You're encoding that and sometimes explicitly it has because the transformer has architecture has the policy. Have you seen any signs? What do you believe in terms of the combinatorial generalization in terms of a long-term plan? Is that something you do? Do you think you could actually do some longer-term multi-step task the ocean planning kind of things all encoded in a big transformer? Or do you still think we have to put one piece together? Yeah, that's the big question, right? I I don't know. I think we can get pretty far with what you might call like reactive style behavior, right? So for example, if let's say there's a kitchen and you wanna just say, uh, get the ball out of the cabinet and indicate where which cabinet it is. And from that command, I think a single actually uh, architecture or a single network can handle that without uh, having explicit planning layers even on top, I think. But I think overall, uh, we clearly need to somehow see how we can combine these representations with more explicit planning in the loop as well. So I would not claim that just magically they will be able to do any kind of task and motion planning system that we need. But at the same time, I think many of the, the problems um, can be done with pretty low level behaviors, right? I, I think actually, at least I, I, I don't do typically super complicated planning, right? When I when I operate in my kitchen or something like that, or even if you go to a kitchen you don't know, uh, you're at a party and you want to get the the bottle opener. Of course, very important. You kind of have a hand and you just do search a little bit, try things, and then and, and and then grab it, right? I don't think there's a lot of really complicated, explicit task and motion planning style necessary for these things. The question is, how far can we get with that, right? Hey, thank, thank you, you. Lida, so much. That was a really great talk.